Hi guys, how's it going and thanks for joining in today. In this video, we're going to examine the fuel shortages, the gaps on the supermarket shelves, rising inflation and the slowing economic growth. Now, Boris, our illustrious Prime Minister, insists he isn't worried. Mind you, he does bring in the head of, former head of Tesco to fix some things. But we're going to ask the question, if he isn't worried, why isn't he worried? Now, despite the obvious shortages in hotels, in restaurants, in bars, in the haulage industry, in the logistics industry, in the warehousing industry, and the farm industry, Johnson has continually chosen to ignore reality and pushes a political agenda of growing pains. In other words, he neither has a plan, nor does he care to explain why not. Instead, he chooses simply to ignore the questions that need to be answered. Okay, Johnson has been reluctant to address shortages of labour and shortages of goods, even going so far as telling the BBC in an interview on Tuesday that they're part of the stresses and strains of transition to a more productive economy. What a load of crap! Crap! This country's national ability to sort out its logistics and supply chain is very strong, said Johnson. What we won't do is pull the lever marked uncontrolled immigration. First of all, nobody's asking him to pull any bloody lever. What we're asking him is to get up off his ass. Okay. Now, before we get into it, if you wouldn't mind smashing that subscribe and bell notification icon, we would be eternally grateful for your trust and for your patronage because without people like you out there, without people like you listening and watching this video right now and the growing support to reverse many of the decisions taken by this conservative-led bunch of numpties, Little can be heard from mainstream media from the silent majority. And by the way, I emphasize now the word majority as the latest polls indicate that there's been a shift with about 8% of Brexiteers having finally woken up to the reality of an economic contraction. Sorry, not 8% um, switch, a 4% switch, so which is an 8% swing and they've woken up to the fast approaching social decline that accompanies such events. Now, as we've all heard and witnessed on many occasions, Johnson is seldom held to real account for the lies that he's told and he instead simply depends on his ability to get the next piece of nationalist garbage printed in tomorrow's mainstream media. For example, remember that 350 million on the NHS Brexit bus? How many of the mainstream journalists in any of his recent interviews have said, what were you talking about with the 350 million? That you've now had to tax people because you say the NHS needs it. Why wasn't he asked that question? He had several interviews, nobody asked the question. Why not? Okay, but instead he simply brushes aside concerns with supply chains, the now obvious price increases, lack of choice on the shelves, and alludes in some cryptic way that such events were always foreseen by him and are in line somehow with his plan to force companies to pay higher wages to British workers. Now that's wonderful if they can afford to pay higher wages to British workers, okay? Now, but in true Boris fashion, however, he never makes such statements in isolation. And instead, he, he brings them all together and accompanies these statements or inferred suggestions with other headline grabbers, such as, you know, making reference to the strength of the UK economy or the record levels of investment or the proven strength of the NHS and, of course, the government's commitments to do this and do that, and he just rolls them out, you know. He normally then adds, like a little cherry, on top of the multiple layers of whipped cream he's placed upon the Brexit cake and makes further, more precise claims on how the UK is going from strength to strength, okay? The problem with this is, of course, that when one takes a macro look at the UK economy, 
it alludes to a whole different ball of excrement okay having appeared on the bbc there last sunday he claimed that the uk was the fastest growing economy in the g7 really of course he did make this micro statement within a litany of other statements and to a question by the way about fuel shortages and described them more like growing pains intimating that just like a child with growing pains the uk will grow to be bigger and better so first off the uk economy is expected to grow seven percent in 2021 this is exactly the same as the us so it isn't the highest in the g7 but it's seven percent on what the uk suffered the previous year which was not only the biggest contraction of most economies at 9.85%, it also recorded record levels of deaths. And guess what? It still continues to claim that top spot within Western Europe as the equivalent of a fully laden Boeing 737 crashes and kills everybody on board every single day, every single week since he announced that the UK had defeated the virus and had Freedom Day. A Boeing 737 every single day. But I'd like to remind him that the 11,000 people that have died since Freedom Day, their victory was very short-lived and he needs to remember it, okay? But back to the reality of GDP. The fact is that the UK is taking longer to recover from the pandemic than the Eurozone. That includes three of the G7 members, okay? UK GDP is not forecast to return to pre-COVID-19 levels until the first quarter of next year. And even that has been amended. Three months later, by the way, already three months later than the expected return of the EU and six months later after the US, okay? Now, but more worrying now, unfortunately, is the rate of the UK's economical recovery. And it's stalled significant, significantly with almost complete stagnation, estimated to be evident in September and in October figures. Incredibly, however, nobody will be surprised if the ONS figures claim, else, claim otherwise. And should the ONS still claim growth, and should Boris jump on this, there are now industrial bodies such as farming, such as construction, such as logistics, such as retail, such as hospitality, that are going to, at first, raise eyebrows, and perhaps then their voices in absolute disbelief, as it just wouldn't make any sense. And that is exactly what's going to happen. And we've kind of seen a hint of it now because as we've seen the rise of the pump uh, at the, the rise in prices at the pumps along with the rise in the cost of a normal family food basket with the cost and the rise of energy bills etc the threat of an imminent rise in interest rates looms over the economy and most in the city see that happening as soon as november however as the Bank of England has now become far more politicized than at any other time in living memory and any other time in history, I think, many economists unfortunately also feel that the Bank of England will succumb to political pressure from Sunak to maintain interest rates. And basically speaking, throw the dice. Go to Las Vegas, hit the crap tables, see what happens. Let's be clear on this thing. When you go to a casino and you throw the dice, the casino inevitably, they always win. And be under no illusion. Should prices continue to rise, or even simply now maintain the levels they've achieved thus far, without some form of correction, the economy is going to come to a grinding halt as companies begin to pass on cost increases more rapidly. However, more obvious will be the definite shorting of the pound, creating extremely more demanding challenges for the exchequer to raise the necessary funding on the international bond markets at a cost that makes sense, okay? At a cost that makes sense. 
Now, let's just look at Johnson's claim of rising wages and investments and how salaries had remained flat over the last 10 years. First, over the last 10 years, it's the bloody Conservative government that were in power. It wasn't anybody else. In fact, it was the last 11 years. He mentioned how people on low incomes are paid more and that wages are going up for the lower paid faster than they are for people on high incomes. This is true, absolutely. But on this claim, even his own ONS warned that such data must be interpreted with caution as earnings were affected by the pandemic and wage growth turned negative. As Paul Johnson, director of the Institute of Fiscal Studies, said on Monday, he added there was little evidence of change to poor wage growth linked to low productivity that plagued the last decade. Okay? Johnson, along with every conservative politician, has mentioned how high value and higher productivity is going to shape the future of the UK. Okay? The economy has been mentioned more times than, than Santa Claus at Christmas time. And he's mentioned it in specific reference several times in relation to HGV drivers and the challenges facing the industry. Now I have a question. How exactly can HGV drivers become more productive without, of course, endangering people's lives? Because as far as I know, the only way to increase productivity in drivers is to either drive faster or drive longer. Can't think of anything else. Or maybe you want to say the drivers operate within a JIT, you know, just-in-time deliveries. Well, who in their right mind is going to depend on that system right now? Underlying wages of lower paid positions are probably rising by about 4% at the moment. But inflation is already well above 3%. This salary rise is not being felt by those in the middle income bracket. They're just paying more. It is being felt in their pockets when they're buying their week's provisions. Okay? Tony Danker, who's the director of the CBI, Confederation of British Industry, said on Tuesday last that from the government wish list of higher wages, higher skills, higher investment, and higher productivity, the challenge we have is that only the first one is rising, i.e. higher wages. And that's why people are worried about inflation. The CBI want to see more from the finance minister in a few weeks' time in the next, they call it a correction, it's a budget. They need to see what is the plan to get these high skills, high investments, high productivity that make high wages a good thing. They need to see how that's being done rather than something that's already causing economists and the finance minister himself some concern. Okay? Okay, that's what we're asking, but he's now taking fire from his own side since Simon Wolfson, CEO of the retailer Next, and a prominent member of Johnson's Conservative Party, says worker shortages are a real problem, affecting thousands of restaurants, care homes, fruit farms, warehouses, and many more businesses. And that inflationary spiral, an inflationary spiral could follow. His words, one of his own. Wolfson wants businesses to be allowed to sponsor as many visas as they need, but is being met by a pretty wall, bit of a pun there, when he raises such a possibility. In short, we might just see those good old days that many seem to remember through rose-tinted glasses before we joined the EU, but have forgotten that why we joined the EU. It was an elastic effort to expand British manufacturing, to secure food supply, and to capitalize on this new thing that was down the track called the financial services industry. Well, we secured two, and we definitely secured three. And because of Brexit, we took two, we took three, we said shove it up your backside and handed back the goose that laid the golden egg. Thanks a lot, Brexiteers. You've done us proud. See you on the flip side, guys.